Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much. I just got an error here. Okay, great. So we're live. Thank you so much. My name is Dennis Brown, and today on my Freightburger Bootcamp Live, we're going to talk about the new FMCSA freight broker fraud prevent prevention ruling. Okay, so there's some new ruling that came down from the FMCSA. If you're a broker, you're thinking about becoming a broker, you definitely want to hear this because there are some things in here that are going to impact both good and bad brokers. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to break it down fact versus fiction. And because uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding out there and a lot of bad information going around. So I'm going to give you my hot take on it. I'm going to share with you my thoughts. We're going to go through the ruling in detail so that you fully understand what's going on. And, uh, and then we're going to go from there. Okay. So, but here's the good news. Okay. I'm going to give you the good news up front. The sky is not falling. The world is not going to end for freight brokers. Okay. That that's, that's the rainbow at the end of the, you know, that's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Okay. So don't, don't, um, don't disappear because I'm going to break it down, but I am going to kind of spill the popcorn in the lobby and let you know that brokers are not going out of business unless they're doing business the wrong way. Okay. So we got a bunch of people jumping in. So here's the agenda. Um, this video seems a little choppy, but uh, it is what it is. All right. So um, we're going to do the, we're going to talk about the ruling. We are going to do a, uh, we may not do a free giveaway today. Okay. Probably won't do a free giveaway today. And then we'll jump into live Q and A at the end. So if you got questions, anything to do with freight broker startup or freight broker sales or freight broker marketing or anything to do with becoming a successful freight broker or freight agent, hold those questions to the end. Or if you have questions about the topic we're going to talk about today, this new FMCSA ruling, hold tight. Okay. Wait, hold those questions to the end. We're going to do some shout outs really quick and then we'll jump in. Cynthia Moore, welcome from Maryland. Uh, As Asadij, welcome from Boston. Nino from Florida. Kevin Perry from Raleigh, North Carolina. Patrick from Zambia. Uh, Trey Got Game from Beckley, West Virginia. Yeah, hit me up in the city and state that you're logging in from so I can give you a quick shout out. Ken Mumford from Holly, Michigan. Dave McMahon from Houston, Texas. Matthew. Lopes, welcome. Lopez, Mike Sauls from North Carolina, Powitter from Toronto, Sean, where was that? Lemansky from Chicago, welcome. Ulazimir from Belarus, as usual. Shaka from Hope Mills, North Carolina. Louis, Luis from Florida. Victor Leon from Los Angeles. Lena Marcella from Colombia. Brandy Hobbs from Oklahoma, John Heller from Johnstown, PA. Welcome. Maria from Ecuador. Amazing. Man, we got people from all over the place. One, two from Miami. Luis from Lehigh Acres, Florida. Corey from Billings, Montana. Keith Starks from Frisco, Texas. Lizeth from Texas City, Texas. Steve Tabor from Kansas City, Missouri. Freight Broker Adventures from Columbia. Man, we got people from all over the place. So thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you being here. This is an important live. It's not a training. We are going to talk about something very specific that has just happened in the last week that is going to impact both good and bad brokers. I'm going to break down this new ruling from the FMCSA. Okay, so we're going to break that down. Uh, I'm going to give another minute or so for people to get live, and then we're going to dive in, and then we're going to do Q&A on the back end. So hold your questions. If you type your questions in now, they're going to get lost in the feed. I promise you, I will not see them. I will not get to them, okay? So that's what we're going to do. Let me grab a quick drink, and then we're going to get started here in just a minute. Ryan Merce from Lancaster, PA. Nick Scott from Indianapolis. Robert Blake from St. John's, British Columbia. Christina from Braunfield, Texas. New Braunfield, Texas. Daniel from Vegas. Man, we got people from all over the place. All right. Benny Dent from West Point, Georgia. All right, cool. So today I want to share with you fact versus fiction about the new FMC. FMCSA 
freight broker fraud protection ruling. Okay. That's kind of the framework of how they're positioning this new legislation, this new ruling that the FMCSA is coming down with. Okay. So here's what I want you to understand. There are five components to this new ruling. And I'm going to briefly summarize them for you, but we're really only going to touch on three today because those are the primary ones that are going to impact freight brokers, freight forwarders, okay? So number one is assets readily available. I'm going to dive into that in a minute. The second one is the immediate suspension of uh, broker operating authority. I'm going to dive into that one too. And then the third one is surety and trust responsibility in the case of broker financial failure or insolvency. Okay. So those are the three. There's two more, which is enforcement authority. And the other one is uh, entities eligible to provide trust for broker trust funds filing uh, known as form BMC 85. So those more have to do with uh, new rulings and guidelines and requirements for actual surety bond and trust providers. It's not so much going to heavily impact the brokers, but these first three are definitely going to have an impact. So the goal here for this legislation, as stated by the FMCSA, is to help support and protect small carriers, small motor carriers, owner operators, and small fleets. Because what happens is a trust or a surety bond is designed to protect up to $75,000 worth of that bond or trust. So unfortunately, when a company goes out of business, they may have more receivables than that. Um, that bond may have already been filed on. So it's kind of a first come first serve type of basis for paying out those claims in the event that a broker goes out of business. And on the second side of it is that there are always in every industry people that will operate unscrupulously and fraudulently. And that does happen in the broker side of the business, just like it happens in the carrier side of the business. There's, there's fraud in every industry. And obviously, I think one of the primary reasons why this has been put in place is really to try to prevent fraudulent brokers from, um, from, you know, destroying new carriers or small carriers, right? So I think that's part of the reason. So my, my thought is the positive side of this legislation and these new rules, I should say, by the FMCSA is that it will hopefully get rid of a lot of the fraudulent brokers. Now, time will tell what's going to happen there. But what I want to do is I want to share my screen really quick with you. And I want to walk through uh, the different components of this. So give me one second to pull my screen up. Sorry, I didn't have that done already. Give me uno momento. All right, hold on a second. Why is that not working? Hmm. That's not good. Hold on, give me one minute, guys. Okay, sorry, give me one second here. I apologize. All right, give me one second. Here it is right here. All right, so hopefully we can do this. I'm sorry, I apologize, guys. Okay, so this should, uh, you should be seeing the screen now. And, oh, not yet. All right, cool. So here we go. All right, I apologize for that. All right, so here we go, guys. Here's what you can see. It says the FMCSA tightens regulations to prevent fraud by brokers. All right, so here's the breakdown, okay? Um, the five areas that I talked about, and this is the link to it. I'll put it in the comments and I'll put it in the description below so you guys can check it out and go through it piece by piece. 
But first, you have to understand this rule will go into effect. These new rules go into effect as of January 16th, 2024. But there are different enforcement dates for each of these five different rules. So pay close attention to that, okay? The first component of this is assets readily available. So I'm going to read this really carefully. Then I'm going to give you my take on it because this is important. The final rule says cash, irrevocable letters of credit issued by federally insured depository institutions and treasury bonds are acceptable categories of assets readily available in broker trust funds whom which to pay claims to carriers. So basically what it's saying is the FMCSA has determined that these asset types are readily available because they are stable in the value and can be easily liquidated within seven calendar days of the event of a trigger of a payment from the trust, according to the agency. Other asset classes such as real estate or not sufficiently liquid while stocks, non-treasury bonds and other securities involve significant risk to the investor. And therefore, none of these asset classes can be considered readily available. So what this is really talking about is BMC 85 trusts. This is really not an issue with surety bonds. This is more of an issue with trusts. And so BMC 85s are a trust where you have to have you have to pledge $75,000 worth of assets or be approved for $75,000 worth of credit that would then be used as assets to support the value of that of that trust. And so what they're saying now is that if you want to get a trust, a BMC 85, the only forms of credit that you'll be able to use is irrevocable letter of credit issued by a federally insured bank or, or treasury bonds, right? So those are the two forms of credit that you will be able to use as a BMC 85. Now, understand something. The compliance date for this is not until January of 2026 because they that's two more than two years from now. They want to give small businesses the time to be able to make those changes, to be able to actually, um, you know, begin, put themselves in compliance, an opportunity to do that. So they know that that could take some time. So if you are a BMC 85 broker right now, um, you've got two years to resolve this. Okay. So it's not something, again, the sky's not falling tomorrow. Um, you will have time to either switch to a BMC 84 surety bond under this new ruling and, or you can, um, become compliant with this component of this new ruling. Okay. So that's part one. All right. The more important one is the next two that I want you to pay close attention to. So lean in very, very important. Okay. I am not going to read this entire thing, but there's a section here that I want you to understand. If the available financial security falls below $75,000, and the broker does not replenish the funds within seven days after notice from the FMCSA, the agency will issue a notification of suspension of operating authority to the broker or the freight forwarder. Okay, so what that means is this, whether you have a surety bond or a broker trust, in the event that they are pay out, that they have to pay out a carrier claim on your bond or trust, okay, you basically have seven days to replenish that within the trust or within the surety bond, okay, or the FMCSA has the ability to um, cancel your authority, suspend your operating authority, okay? So that's the big hammer that the FMCSA is yielding or wielding, I should say, over brokers and freight forwarders. What they're saying is that brokers need to turn these claims around quickly, these bond claims around quickly. And if they don't, if they're not turned around, then, then the uh, FMCSA will issue a suspension. Now, if you are suspended, you will have the ability afterwards to prove that it was not a proper or illegitimate suspension and they will reenact your broker authority. But ultimately, they do have the ability to cancel your operating authority, okay? So that's a very important one, okay? Obviously, they're going to provide all this notice in writing. It's not just something random and you will have those seven days to actually, you know, to remedy the situation, okay? All right, so the next one. 
surety trust responsibility in broker failure or insolvency. Okay, so listen carefully. This is an important one. Surety bond, surety providers or financial institutions may cite financial failure or insolvency of the broker as grounds for canceling a surety bond or a BMC 85 trust agreement. When the providers, when the provider institution either makes a payment against the bond or trust fund or expects to make a payment after aggregating multiple claims. Okay. So understand something in the event that a surety bond or a trust provider actually ha has to make a payment against the bond or the trust, and they expect to make a payment after aggregating multiple claims um, in the new FMCSA rule. Um, it defines financial failure and solvency as any payment made or default pursuant to the regular regulatory provisions that addresses the situation under which a broker or op, a broker's operating authority may be immediately suspended, which the broker or freight forwarder does not cure in accordance with the rule. All right. So what it means is this very simply in the event that a surety bond company has to pay out, right? Um, has to pay out or they believe that the broker is insolvent or has significant financial duress, they are required to notify the FMCSA, if this is, which is what it says right here. If the surety or trustee becomes aware that a broker or is experiencing financial failure or insolvency, it must notify the FMCSA and initiate a cancellation of the financial responsibility, and the FMCSA will publish a notice of failure. Okay? So, as you can see here, what's happening is they're trying to tighten up the time frame between when these bond claims come in and when a broker goes out of business, potentially, so that they can limit the, the damage associated and caused, you know, to small carriers, right? So they're really trying to protect small carriers. Now, there's a couple of other things here that I don't really want to dive into enforcement authority and, 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 you know, entities eligible for trust because those really don't have anything to do with brokers. But here's what I want you to understand. All right. First of all, I was around, uh, I started my brokerage back in 2003. I think it was 2013. When I first started my brokerage, there was only a $10,000 bond requirement. Okay. That's all that was required back in 2003. And uh, carriers pushed very hard to get that bond increased to $75,000 in, in October, I think of 2013, uh, 10 years after I started approximately. Um, the FMCSA made a ruling that said brokers now had to have a $75,000 bond. All right. So the key here that I want you to understand is that at that time, every broker was, you know, every small broker was scared to death that they it was going to put them out of business and that the sky was falling and that the world was going to end and that their bond costs were going to go up to 10 or 20 or $50,000, right? That was what was going on. That was what was going through brokers' heads. First, I want you to understand, I want you to take a deep breath. I want you to calm down. And while I am i don't believe that more government intervention is the, is the solution to this problem, I don't get to make the rules. You don't get to make the rules, right? So the reality is the FMCSA has brought these rules down and now we have to live with them. And so the reality is, if you are a broker and you are doing business properly and you are paying your carriers and you are honoring your bond or surety, bond, surety you know, your bond or trust terms, then you're not going to have an issue. That's the facts. You know, we don't know what it's, how it's going to impact bond prices. It may actually decrease bond prices potentially but potentially it could increase them. We don't know yet. We won't know until the market reacts. But the fact is, if you're a bad actor, this is going to limit the damage. It's going to limit the opportunity for them to gain. And so I think in some respects, it could be good. Again, I'm not a big believer in government intervention as the solution. I think there's a lot of unintended consequences with over-regulating things. 
Um, and the fact of the matter is, here's what I want you want to share with you guys. The component, I want to put this back up on the stage here really quick. The component where they talk about the uh, broker insolvency, right? Where if they have to draw down. So a lot of this can be headed off at the pass by brokers in the event that you put a clause in your contract, in your broker carrier contract that says something to the effect, um, if a, you know, if again, carrier payments may be offset for unresolved freight claims, payments on claims may be withheld until the claim process has been finalized. Now, I thought of that as a part of the solution to this, because ultimately, one of the challenges with um, with this ruling is the fact that sometimes brokers will withhold payment from a carrier based upon a freight claim. And right now, the problem with that is in the event that the bro the carrier files a claim on that invoice on that load, the surety bond company potentially could see that as a financial issue, uh, insolvency trigger, and then they would obviously notify the FMCSA. But in the event you have that clause or something similar to that in your contract, you can then provide that carrier broker contract to the FMCSA or not to the, to the surety bond company. And at that point, now that should preclude you, that should exclude you from any sort of um, backlash because ultimately the carrier agreed to this in a private contract, right? So they have waived their right to that because it's a part of that contract. So that's a simple solution that could save everybody a whole lot of time and aggravation. Again, I'm not telling you to not pay your carriers, okay? I took a lot of pride when I was a broker in paying my carriers on time. I took a lot of pride in my credit, just like I do my personal credit. And I think you should too. You should honor the terms of your carrier agreement, uh, you know, the payment terms and everything included in there. So, you know, I don't think that my takeaway from this is this. Again, number one, I don't believe that more government regulation is, is, the, is, the, is the solution because there are always unintended consequences but I also don't believe the sky is falling. There's a lot of people out there in the streets right now that are very nervous. They're talking about this. Of, of course, there's very clickbaity headlines out there that, you know, the world is ending for freight brokers, but it's not. I promise you, if you're doing business properly, then you're probably not going to notice this at all. I mean, the fact is I went back uh, through my, you know, uh, mental archive here and my first year in business as a broker, we did $1.2 million in sales and we only had one freight claim, one freight claim out of $1.2 million in freight. Okay. We only had one freight claim and that ultimately ended up getting resolved and wouldn't, wouldn't have even triggered an issue here. But the point is, is that if you're doing business properly, you should not have an issue. If you're doing it fraudulently or you're misrepresenting yourself or you're just not you're just not doing what you agreed to do and paying carriers on time, then so be it. The fact is, you know, if I were a carrier, I would obviously have some of these concerns as well. So I hope this again, the summary here is this. You know, there's a couple of things that you need to understand and I'm going to put the link to the um, to the article in uh, the description, but the fact is, you know, for BMC eighty five trust holders, you know the the readily available assets. That's number one. Number two, immediate suspension of freight brokers uh, operating authority. You know, the other part is the surety or trust responsibility in case of freight broker financial failure or insolvency. So the fact is, you have to make sure you're paying your carriers on time, and if you add that clause, as I suggested to your contract, and there is some sort of a claim, you will, you should be able to withhold that payment until that claim is resolved. Again, that clause is simple. Carrier payments may be offset for unresolved freight claims. Payments on a claim may be withheld until claim process has been finalized. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice. 
That's what I would do if I were a broker in today's age. I would add that clause to my agreement and I would only use it, obviously, in the event that there was a true freight claim that wasn't resolved. So if it's an unresolved freight claim, then I have the right to go through the process to resolve that freight claim. And we all know that that's not going to happen in seven days before the potential trigger. So that is what will significantly, that will back you up and that will help you have a conversation with your your bond or trust company so that they do not trigger a notification to the FMCSA so they they do not cancel or suspend your operating authority. So I hope that helps. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of questions and I know it's a little bit confusing, um, but we'll jump in on the Q&A. And if you guys are curious about becoming a freight broker or a freight agent um, and you want to learn more, you're trying to get from point A to point Z, you know, you're trying to connect the dots, check out freightbrokerbootcamp.com. I uh, trained over 10,000 students, uh, w- way more than 10,000 students in the last decade. And we offer a 60-day, 100% unconditional money-back guarantee. And if you're looking for help, I've, I have a lot of people reaching out to me all the time about needing help with getting shippers, especially as a startup. You're just getting started. Maybe you've been in business three, six, 12 months, um, and they're struggling to get shippers. You, what you need to do is you need to get on my... Uh, wait list for my Freight Broker Sales Accelerator. The Freight Broker Sales Accelerator, it's closed. It's sold out right now, but it will reopen fairly soon, probably in the next month or two. And that is where I take, it's a five-week coaching program where I take that piece of my brain and I plan it into your head and I help you implement it within your organization so that you have a, a proven sales system that will allow you to get customers in any market whether the whether it's record tonnage, freight tonnage, or it's a recession, you'll be able to get customers based upon this system, right? And it's a proven system. It's the same system that I use to do over $200 million as a freight broker. So get on the wait list at freightbrokerbootcamp.com forward slash wait list. If you're not on the wait list, you will not have a chance to get enrolled because it sells out every single time. Okay. So appreciate that. And all right, cool. So we're not going to do a drawing today. All right, we're not going to do a free giveaway today. Um, But if you guys have questions about the new ruling, hit me up in the in the comments. We'll do a quick Q and A, and then we'll uh, go on our day. Hopefully, you guys got a bunch of loads to move or a bunch of prospecting calls to make. Either way, I want to give you, I want to free up your day to be able to do that. So hit me up with questions in the comments. Be specific about your questions. I see a question down here now. Nino says, what about BMC 84? Um, again, that is a surety bond. Okay, so a BMC 84 is a surety bond. And it falls under the same guidelines as if you do not resolve, if they have to pay out a carrier claim, you have seven days to resolve that, right? And to, and to resolve that claim with the, the surety bond provider and the carrier. And if you do not, and it's a drawdown on your bond, then the surety bond company is required to notify the FMCSA and then the FMCSA will suspend your authority. Okay. So that's the, I don't know what your exact question was, but I'm assuming it has to do with that. Okay. Question. Hi, Dennis. In your experience, are prospects more willing to talk about their personal interest hobbies or about technologies that will optimize business operations, or is it a 50-50 split? Uh, You know, it depends on the person, right? It depends on two things. Number one, it depends upon the person delivering it, the salesperson. And number two, it depends upon the individual receiving it, right? There's people are... A lot of people are different. Not all traffic managers, shipping managers, warehouse managers, um, you know, are created equal. They're different as are not every salesperson or every freight broker, right? So it'd be impossible for me to give you a 50-50. Here's what I could tell you. When you're creating a compelling sales hook and you're trying to build rapport and you're trying to develop some sort of a relationship, I think you should try to use both. Um, you know, I loved always trying to focus in on, you know, I would lead with, you know, a sales hook that usually had something to do with their industry that's going on with their industry or was a pain point or was an issue. And I guess you would talk about that, like, 
maybe technologies that'll optimize your business operations, but that might be a sales hook, right? That you could use. But I would very quickly try to find that personal component, whether it be, you know, their family or their hobbies or sports or, or, you know, where they went to school or <clears throat> favorite restaurants or, you know, places they went on vacation, things of that nature. I would always try to bring that personal component into it. So my answer to you is I would lead with the business case and then I would fall and then I would readily try to, if I, if I was able to get through the first five or 10 seconds and they were willing to give me another minute or two during that next minute or two, that's when I would try to extract or make a connection on a personal level. Okay. So I hope that helps. Uh, Sean Lemansky, would you be making cold calls this week or have most people checked out before arriving at the office today? Uh, I would still be doing cold outreaches. Yeah. I mean, obviously Thursday, Friday is, is, is gone, right? There's nothing going to happen on Thursday or Friday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I would absolutely, I think, um, I think now might be actually be a great time to do it. Um, I'm a little bit of a contrarian, right? I think some people think, you know, salespeople like to make you know, they like this. The, the good thing about the good and bad about being a, a good salesperson is you can sell yourself into anything. You could sell yourself, Sean, into saying that, well, you know, this week's going to be a bad week. So I'm not going to make calls because nobody, everybody's going to be checked out. I think that would be a mistake. I think that that's a gross generalization. I think you, I think there's going to be people that are checked out just like in any given day or week. And I think there's going to be people that are, that are available and checked in. Um, I would take advantage of the fact that a lot of brokers are going to say exactly what you just said, and they're not going to prospect, which is going to give you an opportunity to get your foot, potentially get your foot in the door. So I would not um, sell yourself down the road of everybody's checked out and prospecting is a waste of time. So I'm just going to take the week off. I think that's a mistake. All right. Sorry, off topic, but as a new freight broker, I'm in North Carolina. However, do I need to file BOC3 form with every state in the United States or just my state as a broker? Every state. Yeah, every state. So I would get, there's services out there that will do your BOC3 for like 50 bucks and they'll do it in every state. The reason why you need to be in every state, it needs to be in every state you're going to do business in. So my suggestion to you is you don't always know what states you're going to be in and out of. So anytime a load transfer, through a state, you're subject to those laws of that state. And so that state, every state needs to have your address on file in the event that there's a legal claim or a lawsuit or any sort of issues, they have that address. So that's what the BOC3 is for. So you'll need to do it in every state you're going to do business in. And that's not just where you are resided as a broker, but that means wherever your loads can come and go or transport through. So in most cases, brokers just get a BLC3 in every state, and it's really super inexpensive. Uh, Nino asks, what's your opinion on using bidding platforms such as Veritred, Uship, Freightstar? Just name a few. If you followed me for any amount of time, you know that I'm not a big believer in these shipper load boards or shipper bid boards. I'm not a big believer in it. Okay. I have never seen a startup broker ever build a successful business doing that. Not one. Trained over 10,000 students, have hundreds, have thousands of students that are brokers. Okay. I don't know the exact number, but thousands of students that are active brokers building a broker business. And I have no knowledge of one. I do not have any knowledge of one broker that ever did it that way. Now I know technology changes and there may be some value to them, but the reality is there's no way to circumvent the sales process. Everybody wants to do this without talking to people. And I don't freaking get it. I don't get it. You need to develop the skills to, to build a relationship you're not going to build a relationship with a shipper through a bid board or a load board. It's just not going to happen. And you're not going to do it. I promise you. Okay. When, when the entire conversation is based on rates, you're screwed. 
okay? Don't waste your time. If you're focused exclusively on rates, which is what these bid boards are, you're going to go broke fast, right? You need to build real relationships. No, like, trust. Those are the three checkbox. Impossible to do that with a bid board. You need to pick up the phone, visit them face-to-face, -face, start a dialogue, build rapport, find a need, fill the need, and then retain that, provide the service and retain that client. So sales is an incredibly important part of this business model. Now, now here, now in the event that you start developing a relationship with a shipper and they want you to do your rates and submit your rates through some sort of an online bidding platform, that's fine. But you have to develop the relationship up front. You have to differentiate yourself up front, right? It's not going to be, hey, I just go to a board and I can just submit bids. That, that to me is a complete waste of time. I think, honestly, I think it's a joke. The people at Freightstar and the people at Veritred and the people at Uship probably don't agree with me, but I have never, and I would challenge them, I have never found one startup broker that or startup agent that's ever built a business doing that. And if you prove me wrong, prove me wrong. Uh, Robert says, new bootcamp student here, learning it quickly, but could you go over the fuel surcharge calculation again? Okay. Fuel surcharges are either a cents per mile or a percentage of the line haul. Okay. So if it's a cents per mile and it's a thousand mile run and the cents per mile just for easy math is 50 cents a mile, that's $500. Okay. I'm just doing easy math. I'm not giving you what it should be. If it is a line haul, right? If it's a percentage of line haul, whatever the line haul, which is the per mile, which is the number of miles times the per mile rate, let's say it's the same thing. Let's say it's a, let's say it's a $2,000 invoice. Okay. Say that was a thousand miles, two bucks a mile. So it's a $2,000 invoice and you were charging um, 30%, okay, of the line haul, that would mean that the fuel would be $600 or in the total, the total value of the load be, would be $2,600, okay? So what I want you to understand is the easiest way for you to start understanding, first of all, a lot of shippers want all-in rates, so they want a flat rate. They don't want you to break it out freight plus fuel. But some shippers will require you to break it out freight plus fuel, right? Now, the reality is most shippers are going to have their own fuel surcharge, right? Most shippers are going to tell you what their fuel surcharge is, okay? And then you are going to have to adjust the line haul based upon that. So if they're coming in with a lower fuel surcharge, you're going to have to bump up the per mile rate, okay? Because the miles are going to be the same. If you bump up the per mile rate, then you're going to be able to get the exact same amount of money that you need in order to pay the carriers and still make a profit. So I don't know that I could really dive in a lot deeper here, but just know that many shippers are looking for an all-in rate where you don't need to worry about providing fuel surcharge to them, okay? And you're going to give the carrier an all-in rate. You don't need to worry about break. Carriers don't care about line haul and and fuel surcharge. They just care about what's the all-in rate. What are you going to pay me to go that thousand miles? Are you going to pay me two thousand? You're going to pay me twenty-two hundred. That's what they care about. They don't care how it breaks out. Okay, but sometimes shippers want to break it out line haul, which is the per mile times the number of miles, and then you add in the fuel surcharge, whether that be a cents per mile or a percentage of line haul. So I hope that helps. Okay, what if you have an issue with a shipper not paying? Brokers that doing good are having issues with their cash flow because of this. When you were a broker, how did you secure cash flow with customers? Okay, so um, there's two solutions, okay? Well, there's three solutions. One is you operate through a factoring company, okay? The factoring company will provide the financing that you need to pay the carriers quickly. Typically, they're going to advance you 90% of the invoice to the shipper within one to two days. So factoring is a primary solution, especially for startups, okay? 
The second way to do it is to establish your own line of credit, your a personal line of credit or a business line of credit that you can then use to finance your receivables. Let's say you have a $50,000 line of credit. That's going to rotate, meaning you're going to use that to pay carriers. And then when shippers pay you, you're going to use it to pay that off. And then the difference, if you pay a carrier, um, you know, just for easy math, if you pay a carrier $1,000 and a shipper pays you $1,300 for the load, you're going to use the credit line to pay the thousand. And then when the shipper pays you, you're going to pay that thousand down and the rest of the balance is the 300 is your profit that you can then do whatever you want with. That's kind of how the financial management side of this works, right? So that money that comes in from the shipper is not all yours, right? The thousand for that load is the carriers, the 300 is yours. And if you used your credit line, then you're going to have to pay that credit line down. Otherwise your credit line will hit the roof and you'll never have any money to pay it down. So the key is you got to make sure that you have sound financial management. And that is remembering that the if you get an invoice, if you get an invoice paid by a shipper for $1,300, that's not all your money. You might only be getting a hundred or 200 or 300 of that. You're the custodian of that carrier payment. And that's why those surety bonds and trust funds are in place. That's why there are those requirements because you are the custodian of that payment and you need to make sure that payment gets to the carrier. And then the third way um, that you might be able to do it is with your shippers, get them to give you a shorter payment term, give them a discount, a one or 2% net 10 payment, right? It's kind of like factoring your own invoices. So the way that works is this, if you invoice a shipper a thousand bucks, but your terms are, hey, I'll give you a 1% net 10, meaning you'll only have to pay $990 on that invoice, discounted 1%, okay, if you pay it within 10 days. Or if it's a 2%, then you don't have to pay nine, they don't have to pay $980, right? It's kind of like you factoring your own invoices in a way, right? But that's only shippers that are willing to pay you quickly. And so a lot of times, if you can get some of your shippers that are willing to pay you quickly, you can leverage that as a way to help pay some of your other carriers and to manage your cash flow, right? So those are a few ways that you can do that. And the fact is, um, but you know, you're right. I mean, there will be times when shippers will slow pay you. I will tell you right now, if shippers are not paying, do not work with shippers that are paying you past 60 days. All right. I, it's a huge mistake to work with shippers that are paying you past 60 days. You cannot effectively manage and grow this business if shippers are paying you in 60 days or more. Your goal should be able to be, ba be paid between 30 and 45 days. That should be the norm, not the exception. Okay. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Number one, you got to make sure you bill them properly. Number two, you got to make sure you follow up on that payment. And number three, you got to make sure you follow up on that payment. And number four, you got to make sure you follow up on that payment. And number five, you got to make sure you follow up on that payment. Okay. And that's shippers, like anything else, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Okay. Hope that helps. I know that was a lot, but you can replay this and rewind it on replay. Hey, give me one second. I apologize, guys. Give me one second. I will be right back, okay? Hold on one second. I apologize. My my bad. Hold on. Hold tight, guys. I'll be right back. Hold on one minute. Okay. Sorry guys. I apologize. I had a little bit of a technical issue here. All right. So let's move on to some more questions here. Uh, okay. 
TBD asks, what niche would you say is easier for a new broker outside of it being something we're interested in? I mean, as far as the day-to-day -day hassles it could bring, which could be the most autopilot. Okay. So the so what you're asking me is which is the least complex niche that you can that you can start with as a broker that's going to have the least complexity and the least issue potential issues, right? Um, if I break that down, I'm not, I can't break that down from an industry perspective or a geographical perspective, but I can break it down from an equipment perspective. So van freight is the easiest freight. It's the most common, it's the most readily available, um, and it's the easiest, right? That's a, a big enclosed trailer, 53 foot long enclosed trailer that backs up to a dock. And they use pallet jacks or whatever to push skids onto the truck. And then they close that truck up. They go to the delivery and they reverse the order. They pull the pallets off on a dock. And it, that's a typical one pick, one drop van load. That has the least level of complexity. It has the least um, likelihood of having a claim. It has the least likelihood of having an issue, right? Now, when you start adding complexity, to the movement, um, it creates opportunities because complexity creates opportunities, but it also creates complexity, right? By definition. So flatbed freight is more complex than van freight. Refrigerated freight is more complex than van freight, right? Heavy haul is probably the most complex of all the freight out there, right? So yeah, I'd say that van freight would probably be the least complex now, I'm not telling you that that should be your niche, but I will tell you that when I started back in 2003, 2004, that was my first niche. Northeast, meaning it, it originated in New York, PA, up through New England, right? It originated there and went west or south and it went on a van. That was my first niche, okay? And my first year, we did over a million dollars in sales and then we did 3 million and 6 million and 12 million and 18. But we expanded beyond that van niche and that geographical niche strategically over time, which allowed us to continue to expand our growth and our skill set and our and our product offering, right? So I hope that helps. Does that, that make sense? Okay, so what does the broker do to get the surety bond back up to 75,000 after a drawdown? You pay the surety bond company back. <laughs> You've got to pay the surety bond company back. Either you're going to pay the carrier before the surety bond has the issue payment, which is probably what you will do, or you'll have to pay them back. That's the way it works. Okay? Because if you if that draws down, then and you don't and you don't resolve it within seven days the surety bond or bonding company or, or trust company is going to notify the FMCSA and the FMCSA can suspend your broker authority. I mean, it's the same way it is now. Okay. But that's the same way it is now. It's just the timeline of number one, the, the surety bond company is required now to notify the FMCSA within seven days of that drawdown. See previously the surety bond company, um, you know, would sit on that. They would they wouldn't notify the uh, FMCSA unless the surety bond company canceled your bond. And in most cases, I think pretty much all cases, surety bond and trust companies, uh, at least surety bond companies, had to give the broker thirty days notice before they could even cancel their bond. So now, you know, it's it's. What it's done is it's compressed the timeline in which brokers have to react and resolve these issues, okay? So you no longer have this window. You now have this window, okay? So again, in those situations where it's a, you're withholding payment because of a freight claim, right? If you add that to your contract, you should be able to show that to your surety bond provider. And then your surety bond provider is going to say, okay, this is a contract issue and we are not this has nothing to do with our surety bond because the carrier has given up their rights to file on the bond in the event of a claim. So I hope that makes sense.
Okay, Jose asks, under this new ruling, does a $75,000 surety bond satisfy the requirement? Yes. If you are a broker that has a $75,000 surety bond, you're good. If you're a broker that has a $75,000 broker trust, which is a BMC 85, see a surety bond is a BMC 84. A BMC 85 is a broker trust. They're different. So if you are a broker right now with a BMC 84, a, a surety bond, you're fine. You're good. You don't have to do anything. Okay. Your bonding company will probably be in contact with you about this new ruling and any policy changes that they have, or you may want to reach out to your bonding company and start having a dialogue and open that door to have those conversations so that, you know, you can head this off at the pass and make sure that everybody's on the same page. But yeah, if you have a BMC 84 surety bond and you are a new or existing broker, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is make sure that you pay your carriers on time. Okay. That's what you got to make sure. And that you respond to any claims quickly that, that your surety bond sends to you. Cool. Sounds good. Keep me posted. Good luck. I'm um, just scrolling. Give me a minute. Uh, Nina asks, I've purchased the online freight broker bootcamp and the accelerator program. Can I find materials there to create an effective email for shipper who requests an email for info? Um, you mean just a follow-up email where you're sending them, um, you know, your, a quote or your, your bond information or your authority. I mean, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't have a template for that. It's pretty simple. Hi, Joe, per our conversation, here's the information you requested. I mean, literally that's what the email will say. <laughs> right. And then any follow up or call to action you have in there. And then cheers, Dennis. <laughs> right. I mean, there's not much to that. Right. A follow up for information. Um, what's more important is before you get off the phone with that prospect, that even though you've agreed to send them information, you have a next step. You have a scheduled call. You have a scheduled follow-up. You have a scheduled action, something that is going to push that forward because just sending a shipper, a prospect information is not going to get you freight. Matter of fact, that's in many cases kind of a smokescreen objection where they're just kind of disguising it. And they're saying, oh, send me some information and we'll get in touch with you. That's just a blow off, okay? So rather than thinking that you're making progress, what you need to do is you need to isolate that on the call and say, listen, I will gladly, I will gladly send you this information. But let me ask you a question. What happens from there? Can we set up a follow-up call? What do we need to do, right? So yeah, that's, that's my suggestion, you know. If you hear my dogs in the background, I apologize. They're going crazy because somebody's in my driveway. But uh, bu 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 bu. okay, I have experience as a dispatcher for car haulers. Do you consider cars a complex freight? More complex than vans, but maybe not. I mean, it depends. Are you hauling an individual car? Right? Are you hauling a? Or do you have a big car hauler with? you know, that puts 20 or 30 cars on it? Are you dealing with a dealership or an auction? Are you dealing with an individual? You know, I can't say. My gut tells me that van freight is probably still the least complex. But if you have experience in the car hauling business, then it's not complex to you. So why would you, you know what I mean? If you have experience there, then, you're, then the level of complexity, you've already resolved the level of complexity because you understand it. So I would, I would probably stick there if that's of interest to you.
Okay, so Ken Anderson, how does double brokering play into this new FMCSA ruling with a carrier not being paid? Okay, so let's run through the scenario. I'm a broker and Ken, you're the carrier and I broker my load to you. And you as the carrier broker it to another carrier, unbeknownst to me, okay? And that carrier, for whatever reason, let's not get into too much detail, but that carrier doesn't get paid by you, okay? So they're going to come back to me. And let's say, for example, I guaranteed you $1,000, but you guaranteed them $2,000. And they come back to me for $2,000, right? Now, I could, you know, this is a... You know, this is also something that could be resolved inside of a probably may or may not be able to be resolved inside of a carrier broker agreement because you didn't sign an agreement with that, the ultimate end carrier. This could be an issue, right? This could ult ultimately be an issue. If that carrier files on your bond, right, then you're going to have to rectify that, right? So that's one area where in double, if double brokering happens to you, that you need to make sure, but that's always been the case. The only difference is you have a shorter time frame, right? If a carrier at any time filed on your bond and you didn't resolve it, right? The bonding company had the opportunity to cancel you and they would cancel you if you didn't resolve it. Okay. That's just the way it is. And so, so there's really no difference. The only difference is you have less time to resolve that issue, but you'll be notified by the bonding company upon receiving a claim, and then you can explain to the bonding company the circumstances of that claim or why that claim came in. And then at that point, they're going to tell you, all right, listen, this is falls outside of the, you know, of this ruling, or you're going to have to rectify this in seven days, or we got to notify the FMCSA. So in a double brokering situation, it could come back to bite you. So this just brings up the, the importance of properly vetting carriers, right? Properly vetting carriers and not doing business with anybody and everybody who represents themselves as a carrier, okay? You have to vet these carriers very carefully. Um, and I probably am going to do a, a much more detailed training on how to vet carriers. And, you know, I'll do some of that content in the near future. But yeah, I've done some of it for sure. You can see on my YouTube channel how to, you know, I think something to do with um, preventing double brokering. I think I did an entire training on that, but I'll probably do an additional training in the near future. So hope that helps. Okay, Socorro asks, hey Dennis, last year I, I mailed out a check to eCapital and the check was lost. I was able to pay that check because I was able to speak to someone. This year, the same thing happened except this time I was not able to get a hold of anyone. I kept sending emails and calling them and nothing. Um, the second part of this is, so this factoring company reported me as a bad pay and lowered my credit score big time. What do I do to fix it? Um, well, here's the thing. You have to have, you know, in a situation like that, what you need to do potentially is send it certified. If you send something certified where they have to sign for it, then and you show and you, you can show that you sent them payment by a certified mail and they received it and signed for it, that would be the type of proof that you would need um, to do that. But I, I don't know. Well, let me read this again. I mailed out a check to E Capital, and the check was lost. I was able to pay that, that check because I was able to speak to someone. This year, the same thing happened, except this time, I was not able to get a hold of anyone. I kept sending them emails and calling them and nothing. So this factoring company company reported me as bad pay and lowered my credit score big time. What can I do? Well, the only thing you can really do is reach out to them and contact them and have a conversation with somebody. You know, nothing's going to happen by email. Nothing's going to happen digitally. You're going to have to get somebody on the phone. You're going to have to explain the circumstances and you're going to have to plead your case. I mean, there's no, you know, I don't, there's no easy fix here, right? Once something hits your credit, 
Um, number one, you have to prevent it from hitting your credit at all costs, right? Because you can see how that'll impact your business. If you get marked as a late pay and it hurt, takes your credit from a B to a D or a C to an F or an A to an F, which can happen. Just remember, business credit is like personal credit. It takes you a long time to build it up. But if you do something wrong, your credit will plummet in days. The same thing goes with your business credit. So if you don't pay your bills on time, if you don't pay your carriers on time, it's going to reflect in your credit. So you want to get ahead of that. And it sounds like you were trying to by reaching out and calling them. But, um, you know, the onus is on you to get that done and to prove you made the payment. The onus is not on them. And once it's after the fact, it's always going to be more challenging. So I don't know if that's the answer you want, but it's the answer I got. Okay, Nino asks, my niche is flatbed and loads that require specialty trailers for oversized loads. What companies or search words in Google do you recommend for prospecting? Steel, building supplies, heavy equipment, oil and gas, con cement, concrete, things of that nature, things that are big and heavy, right? Piping. Things that are big, heavy, and long. Here's the thing that you got to understand. Visualize any type of freight that you can't back up to a dock and load it easily into a box. So it requires a crane to load it or you have to side load it. That's the stuff that goes on flatbeds, okay? So if you can put it on a pallet, right, it usually goes on a box truck. If you can't wheel it in on a pallet, then it usually, then it, then a lot of times it will go on a flatbed. So if it had, again, if they have to use a crane or side load it, which is a lot of what happens with different types of building materials and, you know, concrete forms and big bulky things that can't go on a pallet. Those are the things that usually go on, on flatbed or specialized equipment. Does that make sense? Okay, guys, so that's going to wrap it up for today. Listen, I know I'm playing it back on my head here a little bit, and I know that the breakdown of the ruling might have been a little bit disjointed, but I'm going to add here. I'm going to do that right now, as a matter of fact. If you want the – here, I'm going to give you two things. Here is the FMCSA article. And this is the Freight Waves article that breaks it down. And this is the FMCSA actual um, post with all of the details about this new ruling. Okay. So I'm going to give you that as well. So one is Freight Waves. One is the FMCSA. Okay. Um, it's the Federal Register, but it's the FMCSA breakdown. So you guys have those here. Um, and those are in the comments. I will also put those in the um, in the description, and you guys will be able to click through to those, and you'll be able to check those out. But listen, thank you so much for being here. Listen, um, if you're curious about becoming a freight broker, just know that the sky is not falling. You just need to do business properly. I remember when the when the ten thousand to seventy five thousand dollar bond happened, and everybody was scared to death that they were going to, was going to put them out of business. And guess what? It really didn't put a lot of brokers out of business. The bond prices didn't even go up dramatically, to be honest with you. They regulated very quickly. And so, um, you know, it wasn't, the sky didn't fall. And that was back in 2013. Okay. So that was a decade ago. And there's more brokers today than there ever has been. Okay. Um, so, you know, the thing is, is that, just just know that. And secondly, if you're concerned about all the compliance and regulatory components of this, just become a freight agent. Start as a freight agent under a broker. Let them worry about the compliance. Let them you worry about the regulatory stuff, right? You don't have to worry about that at all as a freight agent. You can start as a freight agent and start making 50, 60, 70%. You can start working from home 
have all the benefits of making money as a broker, but without the liability or the risk. I tell everybody this, if you don't have a lot of experience, start as a freight agent. Because if you can't make money as a freight agent, you're not going to make money as a freight broker because there's just another level of complexity to it. Okay? So if you guys are curious about that, uh, Freight Broker Bootcamp is the most cost-effective and comprehensive freight broker and freight agent training program, how to start your freight brokerage or freight agency in 30 days or less. You can check that out. We also offer a 60-day, 100% unconditional money-back guarantee. And again, if you guys want to get on the wait list for the Freight Broker Sales Accelerator, which I highly advise, um, then you got to go to wherever this link is, freightbreakerbootcamp.com forward slash wait list. Okay. Get on the wait list. It's not a free program. It's not a cheap program. And the price is only going to continue to go up, but it'll be worth 10 or 20 X, whatever you invest into it your first year, just based on the return on investment. So get on the wait list, uh, be opening that up in the next couple months. And, um, and I look forward to seeing you guys there. Have an awesome day. Have an awesome week. I'll see you next Monday on the next Freight Broker Bootcamp Live.